For the last several years, one of the worst, if not the worst, landscape pests here in the eastern half of the United States has been the Japanese beetle. And certainly Iowans are becoming very familiar with this beetle. They're seeing the effects of the feeding damage in the adult stage in the middle of the summer. They're seeing the effects of the grub damage in their lawns and in their turf grass areas in the fall of the year. And you add together the damage that is done to ornamentals, turf grass, fruits, vegetables, even a little bit of damage to our field crops. And it really does justify this title as the worst insect pest we have. Japanese beetle, of course, is familiar to many of us, but there's a few points we do want to cover. One is to make sure we recognize what it is. Those of you who have seen it have no question, you have no doubt about identifying it. It's this 5 8 inch long beetle. It is greenish, shiny metallic on the front end, and it's coppery brown on the back. It has these little tufts of hair. There's five white tufts of hair on each side of the abdomen. And you add all those characteristics together, the size, the shape, that it's as tall as it is wide almost, the coloration, the five tufts of hair, and there's no doubt that that's what it is. There are other shiny insects, and that has created some questions and some confusion. We have another insect called the dogbane beetle, which is shiny metallic, turns from blue to green to orange as the sunshine passes over the top of it. That we find on dogbane, a weed that grows in the fields. That's not the Japanese beetle. And then we have some other shiny insects that on occasion get accused of being Japanese beetle, but they're not. We mentioned that in the adult stage, they do feed on lots of different plants. They feed on the foliage, flowers, and fruits of about 300 to 350 different species of plants. But with that in mind, we do have some landscape plants that they prefer. If we want to look for Japanese beetle, one of the first places we go to is to look at our linden trees. We also look at the grapes, we look at the raspberries, and even the crab apples, like the one that's here behind me, will show this kind of damage that the Japanese beetles have caused. Of course, the, the, the damage is very distinctive. The beetles feed by eating the material between the veins, but they leave the veins, they leave the networks, so it looks like lace when they get done. The material that's left very quickly turns brown, and even from a distance you can pick out defoliated trees because of the brown cast that has been created by the beetles eating the green material from between the leaves. This goes on throughout the summer. We see our first Japanese beetles toward the end of June. Then they build to a peak sort of in the middle of July. And then there's a long tapering period when, uh, as they disappear again, having laid their eggs, the adults die of old age, and we don't see the beetles until the following year. During that feeding period, the damage can look quite destructive. But what we notice looking at the linden trees along 24th Street here in Ames, those of you who are familiar with town, south of campus there's Airport Road that is lined with linden trees. We see those trees year after year turn brown. The crabapple tree behind me turns brown year after year, and every year they come back. So one of the things we reassure people is that defoliated trees are not dead, they are just defoliated, and those leaves will return. So that's one of the messages is that if we did nothing, our plants would survive, but they would be ugly in the process. Now, when it's someone's roses, they may choose to treat more aggressively than if it's someone's tall tree. And certainly, if it's a vineyard, they're going to treat much more aggressively than a tall tree, just based on the fact that they need the production to, to stay in business. When we do have trees that are infested, we could spray early and we could spray often with many of our contact insecticides. Even though it's 50 years old, the Insecticide 7 is still a really good choice for this. It will control the beetles for a few days, but remember I told you about that emergence throughout the early part of their development cycle. And even though you have killed all the ones that were there on the 1st of July, there will be new ones on the 2nd, 3rd, 4th of July that will also probably have to be treated a few days later. So it takes a lot of spray. The other treatment we have available to us is to use a systemic insecticide that we apply to the soil around the base of the tree. 
The imidacloprid insecticide is taken up in the tree and kills the beetles as they feed on the leaves. If you must have perfect looking trees, that is one way to do it with less environmental impact than having to spray all that time. But that's going to be a troublesome process. It has to be done ahead of the damage. By the time the trees have started to turn brown from defoliation, it's certainly too late to use those kinds of preventive systemic insecticide treatments. Another concept that comes up quite frequently when we're talking with homeowners and with tree care companies about Japanese beetle is whether or not to use traps. And I think this tree behind me is an excellent example of what can happen if you do use a trap. You look to the, to the west side of this tree and you see that it is green. All the leaves are still there. But the part that's right behind me where the trap has been placed has been defoliated. As we have known from ye for years from research that was done at University of Kentucky, the Japanese beetles are highly attracted to these traps. These traps work very well at attracting the beetles. So they are drawn in from all the surrounding area to the area where the traps are located. That is a disadvantage for the trees and the garden though because you have attracted in more beetles than the traps will be able to, to hold. It's certainly emotionally satisfying to look in these traps, to see the number of beetles that have been caught, to dump out a bag full of dead beetles every day, but that is like emptying the ocean with a bucket. You can get lots of water out of the ocean with a bucket, but there's still lots more where that came from. The traps are taking lots of beetles out of the population, but there's a lot more where that came from. So we discourage the use of traps Sometimes they can be used away from what you're trying to protect. Sometimes if you have very few, the, the trap will help you in mechanical control. But if you had very few Japanese beetles, hand picking might be a, an acceptable alternative to you. So if you do use traps, use them with extreme caution. We have not found good justification for using uh, the traps. And especially the traps are not going to work as a control option. Another issue that comes up frequently when talking about Japanese beetle is people have the notion that if they treat the turf grass and if they control the grub stage, they will not have Japanese beetles defoliating their trees the following year when the adults of that generation reappear. It's not that simple. It's not going to work. And earlier today, I was talking to a golf course that had been experiencing Japanese beetle damage and they were spending $30,000 per year to control the grubs on the golf course fairways. And they were treating what the golf course industry calls wall to wall. They were treating all of the manicured and all of the maintained turf areas for white grubs. And they had done this for three years and the white grub problem had been solved they were no longer seeing the dead turf from the white grubs on their golf course. Their linden trees still look terrible. Even though they had controlled the white grubs on about 100 acres of golf course, they still had enough Japanese beetles flying in from surrounding areas to defoliate their linden trees. So what you can do in your backyard, what you can do for someone in, on their property in controlling white grubs, will protect their turf grass, it will not protect their ornamentals the following year. Similarly, killing beetles on the tree will not control, will not prevent the grubs in the grass. So there's lots of pieces of this puzzle that people think there might be an easy solution. They think using insecticide on the ground will solve their other problems, and it's not. You have to protect the turf individually and separately you have to protect the trees individually and separately if that's what you choose to do. Finally, one other concept that does come up and something that the folks in the eastern part of the United States have learned over a long history. The Japanese beetle has been in the United States since 1916. We almost have 100 years of experience with this insect in the United States. And they have learned that there are some trees that are just more attractive. There are some plants that are more attractive and they have learned to landscape without those. 
provided to you is a list of the, of the preferred hosts and those that are less preferred. That information is also online. Lots of that information comes from areas that do research on the Japanese beetle. University of Kentucky, I mentioned, Ohio State University, Michigan State University, other places east of us have had a long history of working with the Japanese beetle and making those results available to the rest of us. So if you just do a, a web search on Japanese beetle food preferences, you'll come up with that list, uh, the same one that has been presented to you.